you. Wow. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Save some for the end. <laughs> How many of you have never seen me before? This is your first time. Wow, everybody. <laughs> so I'm not so famous after all. Anyway, nice to have all of you here. It's a long journey here for me from uh, the farms of southern Idaho, where I grew up, to, uh, you know, next door to Disneyland with all the spotlights and cameras and all of you here, it's just a bit much, it's unbelievable. Um, I did my first four pay seminar in 1963 at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills, California, called Adventures in Achievement. So this now makes my year number 41. So, a lot of years. And my uh, big purpose now is to keep my journey going. I just got back from uh, Argentina uh, last week. And uh, next week I go to Venezuela. Toward the end of the month, back to Italy and Europe. A little later in the year, Asia, South Africa, and uh, Australia. And who knows where else. So from my travels around the world, I just really drop by to say hello and uh, <laughs> share some ideas. But I'm thankful for the opportunity to share these ideas one more time. Uh, the ideas I want to share with you so dramatically changed my life. I'm always excited about the opportunity to share them, you know, one more time. Uh, I quit school at age 19, unfortunately. My reasoning was, I'm smart enough to get a job. How much smarter do you need to be? And with that bit of shallow thinking, I quit school at age 19, a little while later, you know, I went to work, a little while later, got married, started this little family, and I'm out there working hard, doing the best I could, but falling a little bit behind every year. Finally, the creditors once in a while are starting to call, saying, you told us the check was in the mail, and I'm embarrassed by that. And then I'm sure some of you, if you've listened to my cassette tapes or the CDs or heard some of my material, the Girl Scout story finally occurred at age 25. I hear this knock on the door. I go to the door and there's this Girl Scout about this tall selling cookies for the Girl Scouts. I mean, she gave me one of the finest sales presentations I've ever heard. Special deal, several flavors, Girl Scouts, best organization in the world, only $2. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. No problem. I wanted to buy. Big problem. I didn't have $2 in my pocket. I'm a grown man. I live in America. I'm married with a family. I've been to college one year. And um, I've been working for six years from age 19 to 25, and I didn't have the $2 in my pocket. And I didn't want to tell her that. That seemed too embarrassing. So I did what I thought was next best. I lied to her. And I said, look, we've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. We've still got plenty in the house. We haven't eaten. She said, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And she leaves. When she leaves, I say to myself, I don't want to live like this anymore. I mean, how low can you get lying to a Girl Scout, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the ultimate. So I started my search that day, and sure enough, very shortly, I met this extraordinary man by the name of Mr. Earl Schof, and my life was never the same after that. Uh, Chris mentioned ideas, and that's where this whole flow of unique ideas started for me age 25. I had the opportunity to go to work for this extraordinary man. I worked for him for five years, then unfortunately he died, age 49. 
but uh, the things he taught me during that five years transformed my economic life especially, but my personal life, my leadership chances, all of that came from that unique experience. So maybe it's true when the student is ready. When someone says, I've had it, you know, this is it. I don't want to live like this anymore. And then you begin a new search. So make this note now for the first of the notes we're going to share in my portion for today. If you start the search, the odds are excellent you will find good ideas. If you search, you will find. Finding is reserved for those that search. Ideas are not reserved for those that hope. They're not reserved for those that wish. They're not reserved for those who complain. You know, good ideas are reserved for those that search. So the first thing I want to do is congratulate all of you for being here, continuing your search, spending the money and spending the time to come and spend a few days and see if you can't, through the accumulation of hours and speakers that we have during this weekend, uh, go home with a, a harvest of good ideas for your business, for your life, for your marriage, for your friendships, for your economic future, and, you know, for all of the rest. We've all heard the expression, nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. How very true. The walls came tumbling down about 15, 16 years ago in Germany. And the time had come for capitalism to finally uh, reach those uh, unfortunate countries that had been dominated by communism for so long. And that idea now is beginning to flourish. I've been teaching capitalism now for the last 10 years in Russia. I've made five trips to all the major cities. It's incredible when an idea finally comes, and the time is right, uh, what can happen? So, ideas, when an idea and its time is ready, it can be incredible. But now here's the next part for your notes. Nothing so powerful as an idea that comes at the right time. And hopefully today for you and the rest of this series of uh, good trainings, this would be a good time for you. Maybe you've got three numbers of the lock that needs four numbers. And you've already got three already dialed in from, you know, the sermons you've heard and the lyrics of the songs you've listened to and personal conversations and meetings and trainings and seminars and books you've read, all of that, right? You've got the three numbers. And just maybe, just maybe, this weekend, could well be that fourth number for you that you've been looking for. And the lock will open and the door will open and there could be some real new accelerated opportunity for you over the next few years of your life. So I hope that's true. From what I have to say and, and from uh, Dennis and Brian and other speakers that are gonna share with you, um, this could be a very important weekend for you. I hope it's one of those life-changing weekends where you look back and say, wow, I was never the same. And the chances are excellent if you keep going, keep going to as many things as you can get to in terms of uh, information, ideas, seminars, lectures. Because if you go continuously and systematically, some of them will be routine, some of them may be ordinary, and then just once in a while, some may be extraordinary and you're never the same again. And you'll look back on that experience and say, that was one of the days that turned my life around. So I hope this weekend, from what I have to share and the rest of the speakers, this is one of those extraordinary weekends for you. Here's another note to make. No one person has all the answers. No one person has all the ideas. We need to gather ideas from a variety of voices and from a variety of experience, from social to personal to political to the management of time, the conservation of resources, um, you know, business, entrepreneur, career, all of that. Uh, being a good parent, a good mother, being a good father, uh, being a good friend, a business colleague. You've got to have a whole variety of ideas. So this weekend, we're going to have a chance for that. You know, multiple speakers and a chance for multiple ideas to come your way. Next, 
is a little phrase that I'd like to have you memorize. And if you memorize it, I'm sure it'll follow you for the rest of your life. And if you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. Here is the phrase. You can write it down as we memorize it. Here it is. From testimonials and personal experience, repeat that for me. From testimonials and personal experience, we have enough information to conclude. I'll let you write it down. We have enough information to conclude. So repeat for me. We have enough information to conclude. If you were composing this, I don't know what you would write after this. We have enough information to conclude that it's possible. Jot that down, that it's possible. So repeat for me, that it's possible. And the rest. To design and live an extraordinary life. Make that note, to design and live an extraordinary life. So repeat that for me. To design and live an extraordinary life. Now, let's repeat it from the beginning. Here we go. From testimonials and personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible to design and live an extraordinary life. I hope you will give that little phrase, some consideration, and here's what's next. I hope you buy the idea that from testimonials and personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible to design and live an extraordinary life. And what I want this weekend to be for you is the gathering of more ways and means to design and live for you an extraordinary life. I don't know how far you want to go. Here's the first essence of life, and that is self-preservation. To produce enough to take care of yourself. The instructions given right to the, to the couple that left the Garden of Eden. One was to multiply. It's a lonely place with only two people. But here were the next instructions. To be fruitful. How fruitful, how productive should one be? And here's number one to produce enough to survive, to produce enough to take care of yourself. And self-care is important. If you're flying on an airplane, the flight attendant says, if for some reason we run out of oxygen, these oxygen masks will fall from the ceiling. And if you have children with you, quickly take care of them, then take care of yourself. No. 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 They say what? Put your mask on first. Put your mask on first. See to your survival first then you'll be more capable of taking care of the survival of your children. Isn't that interesting? My father had an interesting saying. He said, son, right after me, you come first. <laughs> wow, that's okay. I was in business with Bob Cummings, the old movie star. We were in the health and nutrition business together back in the... 60, 61, 2, 3. Bob had an interesting saying. Here's what he said. I'll take care of me for you. Will you please take care of you for me? So the first challenge in life is to take care of yourself. It is to survive. So to produce enough to survive to take care of yourself. 
But now what's next? Well, all alone, it's a lonely life. So let's say the man now chooses a partner. Now he must figure out how to produce enough for himself and his spouse, his wife, his partner. Someone says, well, why do that? Why not just take care of yourself? And the answer is, it's a very small life. It's a very limited life. We wouldn't call it flourishing. We wouldn't call it abundant. Just taking care of yourself. That is the first rule, but that's only the beginning. So the man gets married. Now he must produce enough for himself and for his wife. And here's the key phrase to make a note of. To live the higher life. A life of togetherness. The storyteller says, it seems even God didn't want to be alone. He created all of these angels. Right. So, to join with someone now, you must produce enough for yourself, for your partner. Now, is that it? And the answer is no. How about children? Let us have children. That's a unique experience. So now if the man has a wife and now he has children... Here's the challenge, to produce enough for himself and his family. Now someone says, well, why take on all of that? Why not just take care of yourself? You could, yes, but you couldn't live this more extraordinary life without taking on the responsibility of having a partner, having some children, and live that kind of extraordinary life. So I think everybody would agree. Now, is that the end of it? No. Here's the next challenge. To produce more than you need for yourself and for your family. Someone says, well, now why start being ridiculous here? Yes, produce enough for yourself. Well, yes, if you want to get married, produce enough for yourself and for your spouse. Now, with children, produce enough for your family. But why do more than that? And jot down the answer, to live a more extraordinary life. So now the man produces more than he needs for himself and for his children so that he can be a person of benevolence, so that he can give and so that he can share. That's the more abundant, that's the more extraordinary life. To produce more than you need for yourself and for your children. Is that it? Let's take it a couple of more steps. How about producing much more than you need for yourself and for your family? Someone says, well, now you're off the scale. I mean, why work that hard? Why go that far? Why produce that much? Some would say, just take care of yourself. Some would say, just, you know, get a partner and that's it, and then children and that's it and be a bit benevolent and that's it, but why not go this next step and produce much more than you need for yourself and for your children? And when someone says, why do that? All of us know the answer, right? Why not? If you've got the talent and the skill and the opportunity, why not put all of that together and see if you couldn't produce much more than you need for yourself and for your family? Let's say you earned uh, $10 million this year and you and your family only need three million. Which would probably cover most families, right? Some families are more expensive than others, as I discovered. Um, but let's say three million would, you know, cover a big high percentage. So now if you and your family only needed three million for the year, now you have seven million to give. And someone says what? Why do that? And the obvious answer is what? Why not? If you've got the talent and the skill and the time and the opportunity and the occasion and all this stuff comes together, why not? Let's go one more. How about producing far more than you need for yourself and for your family? And live the far more life. We've heard the story of Andrew Carnegie, right? Andrew Carnegie said this. He built the big steel industry back in the 20s here in America. Here was Andrew Carnegie's goal. I'm going to spend the first half of my life earning money. 
I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. Isn't that extraordinary? Wouldn't you call that an extraordinary life? And the answer is yes. He got so excited by that goal that the first half of his life, he earned $400 million, which back then was a lot of money. I mean, now, right, it doesn't seem to be that much, but, you know, maybe back then it would total $40 billion, like Bill Gates. So $40 billion he earned the first half of his life. Guess what he did with the last half of his life? He gave it all away. And the big question is, why do that? And the answer is, why not? If you've got the opportunity to live, design and live an extraordinary life, you know, why not do that? So here's what I want this weekend to be for you. Plenty of ideas to take home, chew on, digest, you know, throw some away, refine some, you know, accept some, do some, whatever. That's what this weekend is really for. To send you home with a whole new library of thoughts to ponder, ideas to try, disciplines to work out, uh, some skills to learn, and if we do that and do it well this weekend, you will say, hey, it was certainly worth the time and the money uh, to go to that weekend Jim Rohn seminar, Jim Rohn and Friends. Now make these notes, what I hope you find here this weekend. Ideas plus in inspiration. That's the mixture that really turns things on, you know, sends a entrepreneur program into high gear ideas plus inspiration we need ideas for the goals and plans and we need inspiration for the emotional vitality to put it to work to make it grow make it multiply and here's what else I hope you'll find here guidelines for translating response into results you've responded to the call come search look listen, take notes, get it to take home with you. And I'm sure you're going to respond well to the, you know, seasoned teaching and training that is going to be delivered here this weekend. But here's the key, guidelines for translating response into results. Because results is the name of the game. There's no purpose in learning just for learning's sake. Wisdom and faith, as powerful as those components are, serve no useful purpose unless they are deposited. So make a note of the word, deposited. Wisdom and faith deposited into activity. Wisdom and faith put to work now produces a hotel, produces a, a salt vaccine, uh, produces a city produces an institution of learning, produces a career, produces a relationship, right? Ideas and faith, believing that it's possible that ideas can work miracles, now put to work. So the big job here is getting it all. And so now make the next note. Next is going home and translating it into high activity, good health activity, a better relationship activity an entrepreneur program activity, a new burst of speed in your sales career, all of that. That's what I'm really interested in. Because here's what's important to me, is for my name once in a while to appear in someone's testimonial. Make that note. It's one of life's greatest experiences, is when your name appears in somebody's testimonial. Somebody says, here's the person who found me. Here's the person who got me started. Uh, here's the person who wouldn't let me quit. Gave me more reasons for staying than for leaving. Here's the person who believed in me until I could believe in myself. And then they mention your name. See, you can't buy that with money. And you don't have to give lectures and seminars to do it. You don't have to have an audience like this for the weekend in order to deliver value to someone's life. What if you had breakfast with a friend at Denny's four years ago 
And uh, you recommended this book that really meant a lot to you, and you said to your friend, you've got to read this book. I think it'll make a major contribution to your life. And your friend accepted the idea, went and got the book. Now, four years later, he's giving his testimonial. His business has flourished. His marriage is safe. Things are going extremely well. And someone says, where did this all begin for you? And he will say, four years ago at Denny's Coffee Shop, I sat with my friend and he insisted that I read this book. I went and got it. And that book led to the next book. That led to the next class. That led to developing skills I never had before. And that led to some more seminars and lectures. And now look at my business, look at my life, it's flourishing. But it all began four years ago, Denny's Coffee Shop, when someone said, you've got to read this book. See, that's a person-to-person -person seminar. And those are just as valuable as person to a thousand person to 10,000, right? It doesn't matter the number. If you have a chance to deliver, you know, quote a poem, recommend a book, here's a phrase, like I gave you this one to memorize. I think you'll remember this one maybe for a long, long time. Just something that's really extra meaningful to someone, whether it's at breakfast or wherever it is, whether it's for a child or whether it's for an adult, a friend, a business associate. If you'll keep up that process, I promise you, your name will continually appear in people's testimonials. And now I've had this happy experience now for the last 40, 45 years. And so that's one of the reasons why I came here this weekend, right? I don't need the money. You know, I've long ago made my fortune. I take the money, but I don't, I don't need the money. <laughs> but here's what I do need. Continuing testimonials that say, Mr. Rohn, on a summer day, in Anaheim, California at the Marriott. I was there that weekend and something clicked and the lights went on and I got the gift of some good ideas. Here's what's happened to me. Then they mentioned my name. See, that's what I want. Continuing testimonials that come back to me saying thanks for sharing ideas. Okay. To get the most out of this weekend, jot these notes down now. Number one, be thankful for what you already have. Thanksgiving sets up, you know, the situation where ideas can flow. Here's what locks up the doors of opportunity for good ideas, and that's cynicism. All you have to be is a practiced cynic, cynical about the government and cynical about politics and cynical about the future and cynical about uh, the economy. Cynicism locks all the doors. But if you'll be thankful for what you have, however modest or however much it is, I think that's the beginning of receiving a flow of new ideas. Here's the next one. Be eager to learn. There's already some extraordinary success stories in this room. If we knew how successful, we would give you the podium. I would be happy to take notes. No matter how successful you are, be willing to learn some more. We in the Millionaires Club invite a billionaire once in a while to come talk to us. <laughs> and he says, well, you guys are doing okay, but, you know, <laughs> how about stepping up, right? How about multiplying by two, by three, by five, by ten? Come on, you've just gotten started. So no matter how well you're doing, we could all use another idea, a couple of other things that link together with what you already know, could give you a whole new burst of productivity and extraordinary lifestyle. Then to get the most out of this session this weekend, you have to do what we call some tough listening. And sometimes it's easy to gather, uh, it's difficult to gather up everyone's, you know, attention because our lives really seem to be going on outside this room. You know, a part of our life is going on here while we're here. But you know, some of us, our kids are out there and our business is out there and our career is out there and our job is out there and everything is out there. So sometimes it's difficult to bring yourself within the you know, framework you know, inside these four walls and just really concentrate and do your best to get it all. Because I know how meaningful ideas can be. The name Earl Schof, you know, still rings in my mind. I'm 25 years old after the Girl Scout story experience. 
I'm introduced to a man who I had a chance to go to work for, and over the next five years, the ideas he shared with me not only made me rich, but gave me the foundation for a long-term career of sharing ideas, building business, making profits, uh, hopefully wise investments, made an extraordinary contribution to my life. This unique man, he only went to the ninth grade in school. So the things he shared with me over that five-year period were very simple, very ABC. But that's where I got all of those simple phrases. Let me just review some of them for you very quickly. For things to change for you, you have to change. I kept hoping the government would change and taxes would change and prices would come down and things would get better. And then he said, for things to change for you, Mr. Rohn, you have to change. Wow, what a new revelation. Next, he said, don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. All of this started me on this unique journey of what I now call personal development. Here's another one. This is, don't wish for less problems, wish for more skills. It's not less problems that makes you successful. It's more skills that makes you successful. I tried to convince him by showing him my paycheck that I wasn't doing well and I blamed it on the company. And I said, this is all the company pays. He said, no, that's all the company pays you. I thought, well, that's a new way to look at it. He says, doesn't the company pay some people three, four, five times this amount? And I said, well, yes. He says, well, then this is not all the company pays. This is all you get until you requalify, accelerate your qualification for the bigger numbers. See, that was all great revelation to me. I tried to convince him that things cost too much. He said, no, you can't afford them. All of these were new ways of looking at things. Unbelievable. And so I started listening to all this stuff. Now, some of the things that really accelerated my learning curve so that I could do better quickly was learning the success equations. Here's three of them. The first one comes from the Bible. The question was asked, you know, 2,000 years ago in the Bible, according to the storyteller, what is the key to greatness? What's the key to self-esteem? What is the key to getting honors and trophies to put on the mantle above the fireplace? What is the key to receiving great respect? What is the key to wealth and abundance? What is the key to all of that, an extraordinary life? And here's the answer that was given, capsule form. According to the storyteller, the answer was, find a way to serve many people. Find a way to serve. Find the ways and means, start rendering service. The more you serve, the greater your fortune. Service to many leads to greatness. Key. Next, John Kennedy. Speaking of politics today, we're surrounded by political speeches. Here was one of the best, John Kennedy on his inaugural to be President of the United States all those years ago. Here's what he said, don't ask. Wow, don't we wish that was the current political philosophy? Where is John Kennedy? Where is he? John said, don't ask what the country can do for you. Ignore these promises of what everyone's saying, what the country can do for you. He said, don't ask what the country can do for you, but ask what? What could I do for my country? See, that's the whole turnaround in philosophical thinking. By asking, you receive so little. By serving, you receive so much. So rather than settle for the pennies of what someone could do for you, why not turn it around and find some way to serve? It's a pretty simple process. Here's what I taught the Russians. Johnny mows Mrs. Brown's lawn. She pays $3. Every time he mows her lawn, he collects $3 thinking in terms of what could I do for my country? 
Surely Mrs. Brown is one of the members of the country. So he mows her lawn and collects three dollars and starts what we call an income and a career. Now what's next? And here's what the Russians were excited about. What if Johnny gets Pete to mow Mrs. Brown's lawn? She still pays the three dollars, but now Johnny gives Pete two dollars for mowing the lawn and keeps one dollar because he's the one that got the work. Now we have the beginning of an entrepreneur. Now we have the beginning of fortune. Here's a good note to make. I started part-time on a little adventure learning skills and disciplines. And here's what I began to say with my little part-time job. I said, I'm working full-time on my job and I'm working part-time on my fortune. And the reason is because I found the mechanics. I found the philosophy. I started working it, serving other people. One way to serve is to mow Mrs. Brown's lawn and get the three dollars. The other way to serve is to get someone else to do it and you collect that extra money. Finding ways to serve. That's the key to wealth and greatness. Then here's the next one, and everybody knows this one. I heard Zig say it over 40 years ago, Zig Ziglar. And when he said it, I wrote it down. And if you haven't ever written it down, write it down. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. When I heard Zig say that, I wrote it down, and maybe you want to do this. Underline the word everything. That's what was intriguing to me about this sentence. So these are the success equations. This is the wealth formula from the Bible, from John Kennedy, from Zig Ziglar. Now, make these notes. In the journey of personal development, one of the first things to learn is the lesson of the seasons. Let me cover as much of this as I can before we take our first break for the day. The lesson of the seasons. For your notes, life and business is like the changing seasons. One of the best ways to illustrate what's happening in your business, what's happening in your life, is this illustration of the changing seasons. Frank Sinatra used to sing, life is like the seasons. Now here's what's next. You cannot change the seasons. One of the things to, you know, come to grips with is what you can change and what you cannot change. You cannot change the seasons, but here's the next phrase, but you can change yourself. Therein lies the chance to live an extraordinary life, learning to change yourself. In an economic sense, my mentor put it this way, to climb the ladder of success as high as you wish to climb, here's the key, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. He said if you work hard on your job, you can make a living, which is fine. But if you work hard on yourself, you could make a fortune, which is super fine. Then let's put it in philosophical language. Two things on economics, philosophically. Here's the first one I learned. Your income is primarily determined by your philosophy. You know, I didn't learn that until I was 25 years old. They never taught it in high school. I went to college one year and never heard it. Your income is primarily determined by your philosophy, not the economy. Then when I finally understood that, I got excited about it because I knew I couldn't change the economy, but I was assured that I certainly could change my philosophy. And I did that. And here's the philosophy. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. 
Success is not something you pursue. It's something you attract. So the key to the better economic future is to become a, an attractive person with an attractive personality, a, an attractive list of skills, your knowledge of the marketplace, your ability to deal with a variety of personalities, all of those things that anyone can learn with a bit of study, practice, repetition. So the key is, you cannot change the seasons, but you can change yourself. But let's talk about the seasons. Just in a brief outline here. Number one is the winter time. I don't know where we've caught you this weekend. Maybe it's spring for you. Maybe it's summer, you're toughing it out. Maybe it's harvest, you're cashing it in. If we knew the story, we'd let you lecture. But maybe for some of you, it's one of those winter times. Personal winters, social winters, economic winters. There's a variety. So what about the winter? Make this note, it always comes. So you gotta be prepared. Hopefully you've done your homework. You're ready and prepared for this winter more than you were some others that have come into your life where you were less prepared. Make this note of a Bible story. It's very important because it's one of the great lessons of life. I'm an amateur on the Bible, but here's what the storyteller says. There were two nice people. So make the note now, two nice people. Not one good and one evil, but two nice people. However, and that is the drama of life. However, two nice people. However, one built his house on the rock and the other built his house on the sand. Two nice people. People. Meaning it's possible for nice people to be casual. It's possible for nice people to be careless. And sometimes you can be careless and lose your life. Not evil, just careless. In Los Angeles now, when the light turns green, if you're in your car and you're there at the intersection and the light turns green, you better not go. <laughs> for two or three seconds, waiting for the maniacs that are running the red light, crossing in front of you, even though the light is green. That little extra bit of caution, rather than being aggressive, little bit of caution could very well save your life. Here's a father who loves his family. He's an honorable citizen. He makes good money. He contributes to the community, his church. He's a good man. But this morning he's in a hurry in Los Angeles, late for an appointment, and he's pushing it and pushing it with his automobile. He comes to the intersection and the light turns red, and a little voice in his head, head says, go ahead, you're late, you can make it. And now he's dead. You don't have to go to Iraq to lose your life. You don't have to be evil to lose your life. All you have to be is a little careless at an unfortunate moment. So the key is to be not overcautious, but to be cautious. Don't build your house on the sand. Now add this note now, we're all tempted. When I was growing up, there was a cartoon of a little boy, and it showed this little boy with a little devil on one shoulder and a little angel on the other shoulder, both whispering in his ear. And the little devil said, go ahead and do it, it'll be okay. And the little angel says, no, 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 it won't be okay. Yes, go ahead and do it. No, no, no. How often does that occur for all of us? Every day. <laughs> go through the red light, it'll be okay. We must beware, okay? Not to be careless, not to be casual, and build your house on the sand. The same is true with your health. Don't build on the sand. The same is true with your career. Don't build on the sand. The same is true of being in business. Don't build on the sand. Build on the rock. 
because even nice people can make careless decisions, casual decisions that accumulate over a period of time. And those could be the winter. Now here's the note to make. Some winters are of your own making and some are not. Some are just the winter experiences. Maybe the whole country goes through it. It was a long time of winter for the Russians who lived through the communist system for about 80 years. Long winter of political despair, lack of freedom. But what's the key to the winter? Here it is in simple language, hang in there. I mean, you know, winters don't last forever. Some are difficult and some are easy, but they never last forever. The night always comes after the day, but it doesn't last forever, just a few more hours. And if you hang in there, say your prayers, gather a little strength, you can make it through the winter and the night. So winter time. Here's the next season now, the season of spring. Make this note, my definition of spring, opportunity. Spring is not a guarantee that you're gonna have a harvest, but it's the opportunity to plant one. It's not a guarantee that things are gonna go well and you will accumulate what you need, but it is an opportunity to do so. Springtime is opportunity. Now it's usually a very short season, especially where I was raised in farm country Idaho. So here's what you must do with opportunity. Seize it quickly. Don't let it just come and go. When the window of opportunity is open, to borrow a little space language. When they get ready to shoot the rockets or off into outer space, there's a window, they call it, of opportunity to go, not go, when the weather's right and whatever. But if, if you wait a little too long, the window closes and it takes a while for it to open back up. So this is the key. Take advantage of the spring, such a short season. In some places, they got those big tractors with the lights on them going around the clock in the short season of spring to make sure the, the seeds are planted. Take advantage of opportunity. Take advantage of opportunity to meet someone who could be a colleague for your future career. Take advantage of the day when it arrives because the day will soon finish. Take advantage of the year because it will soon close. Take advantage. Now here's the next season. One of the greatest illustrations of life is in the third season called the season of summer. And here it is in simple capsule form. In the summer, you must do two major things. Here they are for your notes. Number one, nourish and give life like a mother. Nourish and give life like a mother. Next, protect and defend like a father. This is called the work of summer. Give life like a mother. Take life like a father. Love like a mother. Hate like a father. Any father would say to whatever threatens his family, take two more steps toward this family, you'll cease to exist. I'm father. I protect, I kill if necessary. So you've got to nourish your garden. And then you've got to protect it by fighting the weeds and the bugs that are out to destroy it. As soon as you've planted, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. Now put this line in your notes. And they will take it unless you are extremely father-like and vigorous. You have to develop a hatred for evil. The old prophet said, love good and hate evil because those twin forces are at work always. Even in the beginning of the beginnings, Lucifer, according to the storyteller, tried to take over God's throne, didn't succeed, and so began the story of the creator and the spoiler. And so exists for all of us, this great drama of the ability to create, but the destroyer not too far away. In another seminar I give, here's what I say, and this is good philosophy. It seems like opposites are in conflict and we are in the middle. 
Evil on one side, good on the other side. Illness on one side, good health on the other side. Darkness on one side, light on the other side. And they're in conflict. If you walk into a room that's dark and turn on the light, the darkness disappears and goes away. How far away does it go? Not very far. Waiting for a chance, what? To come back in. Move in, take over the territory. As light begins to lose its energy, darkness moves in. There's a war on. It's, here's what it's called. Push shove. As we sit here, right? Good health plan is trying to defeat illness and drive it into a small corner. If you don't work on your good health plan, illness will drive your health into a small corner. It's called push and shove. In your bloodstream, there are red corpuscles to nourish like a mother and white corpuscles to fight and kill like a father. Thank God for white corpuscles that think negative all day. <laughs> white corpuscles say, just show me some infection, I'll kill it. Because if I don't kill it, what? It kills you. White corpuscles say, it's my job today to make sure you don't get killed. So I'm here to fight. Have you got that now? Red to nourish, white to fight. So here's the key now. Cooperate with the positive side of this war of health and illness. What if in this struggle the body calls for a banana and you send it a Coca-Cola? And now the body has the right to say what? Whose side are you on? <laughs> I'm working day and night to drive illness into a small corner and keep you healthy, and you keep sending me the wrong stuff. Come on, just a little cooperation here, and we can win this game. But see, if you don't do your push-ups. And what was that little voice in my hotel room this morning? that said to me, Jim Rohn, you don't have to do your exercises this morning. You're running a little late, and this little creature on this shoulder almost talked me into it. <laughs> and the little angel says what? No, 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 no. Fall on the floor one more time. Do those push-ups, a few crunches, a little modified version, yes, because you are late, but you've got to keep up the pace. See, that's called what? The work of summer. Now turn this around because it's also possible to love like a father and hate like a mother just so you get the job done. And if it's a single parent, right, you've got to do both the work of father and mother. It's extraordinary. But mother is capable of hate and defense and protect because I think years ago papa was off providing, mama was home protecting. So she developed these instincts of danger in order to protect her family. Women are good. Women are unusual. They have this antenna that picks up all the stuff, especially danger. In the middle of the night, the baby cries. Mama's awake. Papa sleeps. <laughs> Mothers sleep near the surface. And the least little movement or sound, they're awake. It's built in, the female mother, that instinct. She says to her husband, go look, go look, something isn't right, you know, downstairs. He says, no, everything's fine. She says, go look. He says, okay. He gets up in the middle of the night, stumbles downstairs, and the front door is open. How did she know? They just know. I don't know <laughs> how they know. They've got this instinct, especially for danger. Interesting story in the Bible. It says there are sheep and there are shepherds and there are wolves. Fairly ordinary story. Shepherds and wolves and sheep. But that's not the end of the story. To illustrate a point, the storyteller says, there are also some wolves that have learned to dress up like sheep. Now you need a woman. Man says, looks like a sheep, talks like a sheep. Woman says, ain't no sheep. <laughs> okay. Have you got this now? The work of summer. Here's what it's called, high drama. 
nourishing and protecting, nourishing with one hand and protecting with the other hand, even the battle of the mind. Here's a good note to make on the battle of the mind. Don't become a victim of yourself in this battle of the mind. Should I, shouldn't I, let it go. No, don't let it go. Run the red light. No, be a little more cautious. Think of your family. See, we, we have to continually do this. Beware of the thief on the street that's after your purse. But also beware of the thief in your mind that's after your promise. That little thief that says you're too short, you're too tall, you're too old, you've never done it before. What makes you think you can do it now? Nobody in your family has ever done it. In fact, if you start, they'll all make fun of you. It's called the thief in the mind that steals the dream and steals the promise, makes you less effective than you should be. Here's what you must do, battle with the mind. Now, what's the purpose of all of this opposites in conflict? Here's what I think it is, to create high drama. God wishing it to continue on earth as it did in heaven. I guess that's the best conclusion I've come to. Because here's the last of this now. Would it be possible to win if you couldn't lose? And the answer is no, it doesn't seem like it. If you took a football today and put it under your arm and we went with you to the nearest football stadium, and with that football under your arm, if you walked across the goal line, would we call it a touchdown? And the answer is no, that's not a touchdown. It's not a touchdown until you face the 350 pounders that want to smash your face in the turf. And if you can muscle by them, and if you can dance past the secondary with the football under your arm, cross the goal line, now we call it a touchdown. And maybe you won the game and maybe you won the championship. So jot this down now. High drama is the order of the day. I guess so ordered by God himself. High drama. But that's what makes life so unique, so challenging, so much opportunity. A chance for fortune and a chance for failure. And you've got to defend yourself against one, see if you can't maximize the other. That's the game of life. Isn't this good stuff? I mean, these few simple ideas started changing my life. Age 25, I was never the same. What if you picked up a book? And the book, first chapter said, everything's fine. Uh, chapter two, uh, everything's fine. Uh, chapter three, everything is just fine. Uh, chapter four, everything is still just fine. Would you finish this book? And the answer was no. What kind of a book is this? So the book on your life story, it's not going to be this. It's going to be filled with the full dramas of the highs and the lows and the winter and the spring and the summer and the harvest. So have you got that now, the third season? Do the work of summer. Be both optimistic and vigilant. Two great words of antiquity, here they are. Number one is behold. That's the word from antiquity. The positive word is behold. Here's the other word, beware. One of the interesting bewares in the Bible is a little story that says, beware of the little foxes that are spoiling the vines. It doesn't look like it. You know, I come from, you know, farm country, Idaho, where I make a little wine and grow a few crops. And you can look at a vineyard, hey, it looks okay. But this old, old story says, just because the vineyard looks okay, you've got to look a little closer. The little foxes may be eating the vines. So whether it's a personal relationship, or a business opportunity, or your future, or your life, or the management of your time, or your health, or whatever, I'm asking you to behold the possibilities and beware the dangers. That's the key. And all of that we call personal development. Now here's the fourth season, and I've got a lot more notes for you to cover. How many of you have one page of notes already? <laughs> okay, one. I want to send you home with a whole basket full from myself, Brian. Uh, this is going to be one of those extraordinary weekends. Dennis is here, other speakers are here. 
you're going to have a, a full load to take home. Okay, here's the next season now, the season of harvest. Make this note now on harvest. In due time, and for those who qualify, in due time, and for those who have obeyed this extraordinary law that says life was not designed to give you what you need. Life was designed to give you what you deserve. If you didn't plant in the spring, then no harvest comes your way. If you planted little, then you're not going to receive a lot. And here's the key now for the harvest. Number one, whatever it is, offer no complaint and no apology. If it's a fantastic har harvest, you offer no apology. If it's not much, you offer no complaint. That's the highest of maturity. No apology, no complaint. But here, here's what you can do no matter what it is. Go back to work in the spring. Because, write this down now, spring always follows winter. If the harvest wasn't good and the winter was tough, the promise is another opportunity will come your way. Now, here's one more point now on the harvest, and we'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow. Here it is. Do wise things with your harvest. Build your financial security for you and your family on the rock and not on the sand. We're going to talk about financial independence before we finish this weekend. There's so many things now you can do about gathering resources and wisely investing them so that you and your family are secure. Here's one thing to strive to become early in your life and career, financially independent, so that nobody or nothing has a claim on your assets. Accomplish that as quickly as you can. Then all of the other wise things we'll talk more about. Sarah Alfaro in Mexico came to my seminars and lectures 10 years ago. Single mother, four children, no job, no home, no car, no money. And she only had one American dollar to invest. Now she makes about $40,000 a month, and she's rich and now quite famous. Sarah Alfaro in Mexico. Here's what I taught Sarah back there 10 years ago. Don't buy the second car until you've bought the second house. It's not cars that makes you rich. It's houses that make you rich. If you bought a condo in Carmel just a few years ago for $250,000, it's now worth $800,000. I got a call the other day from Sarah, thanking me one more time for my training. And she said, Mr. Owen, you'll be happy to know, I just finished paying off my third home here in Mexico, so today I'm going shopping for my third car. <laughs> Isn't that good? Unbelievable. Remember, how long ago was it when the idea finally dawned on somebody, if you paid one extra payment a year, on your 30-year loan, you could pay it off in 15 years and save more than the price of the house. Wow. Just a little bit of information and then a little discipline to see it through and the change for your harvest can be unbelievable. We'll talk more about that later on in the program. Now, jot these notes down. Personal development involves three parts. First part is physical, take care of yourself. My mama studied and practiced health and nutrition when I was a boy growing up, paid off. Extended my mother's life at least 20 years, according to the doctor. Mama was a fanatic. Mama was a health nut. Some of the stuff she mixed up for me and my father and for herself, she would say, if this stuff don't kill us, I think, I think it's gonna help. <laughs> and we would gag this stuff down. Mama read, Mama searched, Mama tried. Back when, you know, vitamins and all that stuff was fairly new when I was a kid growing up, Mama did all that research. My father lived to be 93, never had a major illness. Mama extended her life 20 years. My father never did retire. When he died, his paycheck was waiting for him. Thanks to my mother, 
And I've been in splendid, excellent, good health all my life. And come uh, September, I'll be celebrating birthday number 74. Right? Thanks to Mama. <laughs> if there's one thing to be a fanatic about, it's your health. Take care of yourself. The Bible describes it this way. Treat your body like a temple. That's a good word. Treat your body like a temple, not a woodshed. A temple. Something you'd take extremely good care of. Here's one of the reasons why. The body and the mind work together. The body is a, is a physical support system so that the mind can dream the dreams and the heart can believe that it's possible and then go to work and make it happen. And for that, you need a good physical support system to manage all of that. One old prophet said, sometimes, you know, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. See, don't fall into that. You wake up in the morning, and the mind says, let's go get them. The body says, I can't even get out of bed. See, one of these days you've got to say, body, this is the last time you tell me you can't get out of bed. I'll throw you on the floor and make you do push-ups until you're out of breath. <laughs> I'll make you read every book that's ever been written on good health. I'll choke vitamins down you until your face turns blue. This is the last time you say you're not going to vigorously support me to make my dreams come true. You just got to take action now on this stuff here of the physical support system you need to pull off your dreams and your promise and your future. Make this note. Some people don't do well just because they don't feel well. It's not that they haven't got the skills. It's not that they don't have all the rest. They don't have the vitality the vigor, the vitality. Okay. I travel all around the world. If you saw my travel schedule, work schedule, you would say impossible. I'm probably the only one who can do it. Thanks to Mama and my own study and practice of health and nutrition. See, that's the key. I've got this unique physical support system. And I'm, it's going to serve me, you know, another, who knows, 60 years. <laughs> now here's the next one. First is physical, second is spiritual. And whatever you believe about spiritual, I happen to believe humans are a unique creation. Spiritual is part of it. But jot this down now. If you are a believer, jot down these three words. Study, practice, and teach your belief in spirituality. Don't leave your spiritual conclusions unresearched unstudied and don't leave it unpracticed and whatever you do don't leave it untaught study practice and teach if we all do that starting with our family we'll build the families necessary to build a strong nation to compete among the nations of the world in these years of the 21st century now here's the next one it's the physical the spiritual now the mental your mind exercises of the mind build your library I say in one of my other seminars, the books that can see you through, the books that can give you the ideas necessary to build a good career, to build a strong enterprise, relationships, good health, and all the rest. The book you don't read won't help. Now here's part of the exercise of the mind, a good debate, right? We're engaged now in the great political debate with the election coming up in just a few months. This is what we call healthy. We don't believe in the one-party system. Communism said one party. Everybody do what we say. We say no, more than one party, so we can discuss ideas. Here's the way, the way to make an idea powerful, is to discuss it and refine it so that it fits your situation. That's what I ask you to do when the seminar is finished. Debate all of these ideas. Discard some that don't make sense. Give considerations to some that do make sense. Put some on the shelf for later consideration, and then put some of them into action that makes sense. Jot this down. Make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion. Do that thoughtful study. One book on health and nutrition says, do this, you'll live forever. The second book says, if you do what that first book says, you'll die young. So what should you do? Which book should you follow? And this is one of the important answers of the weekend. Neither one. Read both books 
and make up your own mind. You engage in the debate what makes sense, what seems to be or not to be. Because as close as we can get to the truth is to say, it seems like, that's as close as all of us can get. We can't say it is. None of us can do that. We can say it seems like opposites are in conflict and we're in the middle. It's what it seems like. Our experience proves and the storyteller says it started early. That's what it seems like. God is interested in high drama. That's about the best we can conclude. We can't actually state the truth except what it seems like. But engage in thoughtful study and vigorous debate. Sometimes you can debate with others, right? And share ideas. What did Jim Rohn mean by this? Well, I'm not sure that's important to our life. Someone else says, no, I think it is. Engage in this debate. And then here's the big one, the debate in your own mind. What's good, what isn't good. Finally, you must come to your own conclusions. Read the best you can, study the best you can, take the best notes you can, and then do this. Then you decide out of all of that, which is valuable enough to try, valuable enough to do, and add to the dimensions of your life that are already underway. That's the key for study, exercising the mind. Here's the last part. Don't be afraid of the debate. Communism taught. Some people say, well, don't tell people what communism taught. Why not? That's part of the debate. Communism says capital belongs to the state, not the people. We taught all these years. No, capital belongs to the people, not the state. What a good debate. How about the example of capital in the hands of the state? Well, read the history of the communist empire that dominated Russia for all those 75, 85 years. If that's what you want, that philosophy, to get that result? And we say, no, that's terrible. That's terror. That's tyranny. How about capitalism? Makes a country like America flourish. Gives an opportunity where everybody wants to come and try it. Engage in the great debate, whether it's your health or relationships or your future. Don't be afraid of the debate. The Bible serves as a good book, giving you stories on both sides of the ledger. Here's the story of someone to admire. Here's the story of someone to despise. You need both stories to help you with this debate. Okay. Now here's what's next. Develop these five abilities in your personal development quest. To be the best you can be, produce all you can, far more than you need for yourself and for your family. If that's your philosophy and if that's what you want to do, something extraordinary, it's possible to live an extraordinary life. Here's the challenge, and it's going to be working here this weekend. Number one, develop the ability to absorb, the ability to get everything. I don't know what all you've planned here, but you know, you know, be in every class you possibly can. Just stay as long as you can. We're going to take enough breaks, I think, to make it easy for everybody. We all recognize the mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. So I want you to know we are mindful of that. But the key is not to be careless in the gathering of knowledge, not to be casual in the ideas that could double your health, triple your income, accelerate your career, secure your fortune, amplify your harvest. So don't be careless in the gathering of ideas. Absorb every one you possibly can. Here's the next ability. Develop the ability to respond. Let life touch you. Let the stories touch you. Let the drama touch you. Twelve months ago, I was in India. I lectured in four major cities in India. That was like my fourth visit to India. Once again, I was touched by the drama of such extremes of poverty and wealth. If I was given the assignment, Mr. Owen, see what you can do with India, I would say, what could I do? What could I do? Where would you start? Let the drama of that affect you. Make you more sober in your reflections about life. And then say a prayer that what you couldn't do by yourself, maybe a collection of people can do, maybe the future will find some answers. A prayer would help. Let life touch you, but don't let it kill you. 
Let sad things make you sad. Let happy things make you happy. Don't shrug off always the, you know, those times of bitterness that come and sadness that comes and your heart is struck like a bullet, hits it. I'm not saying give in to it. I'm saying let it affect you because that's part of the drama. The old prophet said what? There's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. And then it said be so sophisticated that you learn to laugh with those that laugh and also learn to cry with those that cry. Allow yourself to be touched, moved by the drama. Be touched by good ideas. Be touched by opportunity. Be touched by someone's unique little sentence that might cause you to open your eyes to see things you never saw before. Here's the next ability. Develop the ability to reflect. Part of this is in the challenge when you go home, not to just put these notes away, but to get them out maybe fairly often over the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, just to review the notes, to drive the ideas a little deeper, uh, to come up with a little more refinement. And if you go back over these notes, I promise you, there is something you will discover that you just didn't have the time to discover while you were taking the notes. Because in taking the notes, you're working as hard as I am, right? Taking the notes, trying to listen, trying to decide what to write down, how to compose it in a small sentence if I've, you know, said a long sentence, how to edit it as you go. That's why review is so important. Go back over it again. Go back over it again. Here's what I call it. Run the tapes again the tape in your mind and the tape from your notes and see if you can't capture something you might have missed or to develop an extension of something you got now that by going back over it now you can see now I see here's what I could do with that that might multiply the value of my life by two by three by five here's a good time to reflect when the day is over how did it go and who did you see and what did you say and what mistakes did you make and what did you leave out that you could correct tomorrow Reflect at the end of the month. 30 days, that's when you usually do the accounting for your business and the company and the corporation. Do the accounting for your health. If you needed to lose weight, how many, pound, how many pounds have you lost? Just do a good reflective accounting. I'm trying to do a little study now on the value of the seventh day. Here's another thought to consider on the value of the seventh day. It says labor the sixth, and the seventh is a special day rest, relax, spiritual, church, family, friendships. So jot this down for the seventh day. Multi-purpose seventh day after six days of work. Multi-purpose. And here's one of the purposes of the seventh day, I think, is to review the previous six days. How did it go? Where did you stumble? What did you miss? What should you have thought of that you let pass who didn't you see just review the last six days what went right what went wrong what's there what's missing then here's what you do now plan the next six days with this information of the last six plan the next six I call it multi-purpose seventh day reflect go back over then design plan refine and deposit the experience of the past six days into the adventure and activity of the next six days. You will be absolutely surprised at the value and the productivity of your weeks if you'll start doing a little more of that. Now here's the last two. Develop now the ability to act. Activity now is the catalyst and the miracle piece of the process. Here's a little subject called how to turn nothing into something. Number one, first, imagine the possibilities. Imagination is the first step of the miracle of possibilities. Reality first starts with imagination. Now it's hard to call imagination nothing, but it's not something in terms of a podium. It's not tangible. So it's hard to say how to turn nothing into something. Because nothing is, there isn't anything that's nothing. Everything is something, even if it's the imagination, it's, it's something. 
Einstein once said, there's nothing faster than the speed of light. And Bill Bailey, my, one of my mentors, current mentors and longtime friend, said, maybe here's something faster than the speed of light, and that's thought. It's possible that thought could be faster than the speed of light. How fast can you think back and think ahead? I, I guess we can't say the, the exact same instant, but all we can say is it seems like the exact same instant. You know, if you don't know the truth, you can't say that's true. And if you're not a scientist, it'd be, you know, a little out of order to say, yes, this is true. But here's what it seems like. It's possible to think back and ahead at the same time. I mean, how fast is that? To think back and think ahead. But it's one of those marvelous capabilities that we all have. And in your personal development quest of getting stronger and more vital, both physically and spiritually and mentally, now use this exercise. To think, think back and gather more experience. Think ahead how to apply it so that the experience now multiplies in value by 2 by 3 by 5 by 10. That's key. Now, how to turn nothing into something. Number one, imagine the possibilities. Today, if we had a chance to hear everybody's testimonial of how you got where you are, some of you went from nothing to something, some of you went from pennies to fortune, and if we had a chance to hear everybody's story here today, took the time, guess what those stories would conclude? Those stories would conclude the possibilities are absolutely endless and unlimited. So number one, imagine the possibilities. Read an inspiring book one more time, how someone went from nothing to something. The story of a Sarah Alfaro who started with a dollar, now she's rich. Wow. The possibilities, the possibilities, they're unending. Now here's the next step. Imagine that some of the possibilities are possible for you. We call this now faith. Now we start with imagination, now we generate faith. What generates faith? Faith is generated sometimes when the testimonial closes like this. If I can do it, what? You could do it. I started behind. I started under the basement, not in the basement. I started with debt, not surplus. I didn't start with pennies. I had no pennies. Debt's up to here. Finally got it turned around. Now everything's flourishing. That's what we want to hear. And then someone in a testimonial like that says, hey, if I can do it, you can do it. Here's what that does. Reassures our faith. Keep reading, keep listening to the testimonials. One, that excite the imagination as to the possibilities. And number two, helps faith to occur. That what's possible for one is possible for another. Now here's the third step of faith. Or the third step in the miracle process. To deposit your imagination and faith into high activity. Disciplined activity, not just activity, but skillful, disciplined. Take the classes to learn the skills. Get around people that will teach you the disciplines. And then deposit your imagining the possibilities and believing that it's possible for you. Deposit that now into what we call high activity. Make this note now. Activity finishes the miracle process of turning nothing into something. Activity finishes the miracle process. I'm positive that's why the formula was given of six days of working miracles and one day of rest to ponder how it's going. How is my miracle working process working? Have I missed some? Devote six days to the working of miracles the seventh day to rest and reflect and go back over and a bit of study. Yes, spiritual, yes, church, yes, synagogue, yes, family, yes, social, yes, friends. But see if you can't now come up with a plan to increase your activity or refine your activity. Sharpen it so that it produces major results.
Here's the next one. Take joy in the work. I couldn't wait to get here today to share my story one more time. I'm already pondering the testimonials that may come out of a class like this next year, a year from now, five years from now, if I happen to meet some of you, and you say, on that summer weekend in Anaheim, I finally got it. The lights went on for me. Something you said and something someone else said finally made sense. And I hooked it together, and here's what's happened. That's going to be extraordinary. Right? That's why we're here, to do this work. I was excited this morning about being here. Couldn't wait to hear what I've got to say. <laughs> a lady asked me one time, she said, Mr. Ono, over the last few years I've been to your seminars now several times. Every time I see you, you're all excited. Things seem to be going right, great for you. How do you stay so excited all the time? And I said, I think it's because I attend all these seminars. <laughs> Because this, make this note now because it's very valuable. If you struggle to make something clear for someone else, it helps to make it more clear for you. If one person listens and one person speaks, there is the opportunity for transformation for both. The listener to be enlightened, to see something he never saw before, but the speaker to be better educated on how to present it by struggling with the language. Words are clumsy sometimes when you try to express what's going on in your head, let alone your heart and spirit. But the more you struggle to make it clear, the clearer it gets for you. So that both the listener could be transformed by what he hears, and the speaker could be transformed by the exercise of speaking, trying to make it clear. We're going to talk later about communication. It's, it's almost a godlike quality, communicating, inspiring other people with your language. Now, here's the last part, and I'm finished, and we're going to take then about a 10, 12 minute break, maybe 11, 11 minutes. <laughs> here's the last one. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. ready. For the last one. Develop the ability to share. Not just your money and your resources. One of the biggest things to share, of course, is your time, because you're limited on time. You can't get any more time. Big decision for me to make to come spend this weekend with you instead of with my children and my grandchildren. Right? I'm already wealthy. I don't need, you know, don't need the money. So why would I come? Because my children and my grandchildren know this is part of our collective experience. They enjoy the testimonials that come later as much as I do, the letters I get and the phone calls and the response that people say, hey, your grandfather came and made an extraordinary contribution. See, my children and my grandchildren thrive on that story. So they were willing for me, instead of being in Carmel, uh, sitting on the sand at the ocean where my grandchildren live, uh, I'm here in Anaheim, California. Uh, spending this time with you, but I gladly do it. Here's why. It's an investment time for me to share. So that later comes the harvest. One, the harvest is by working hard to make it clear for you, I'm getting as much as you are. But then later hearing the testimonials. So I'm asking you to do the same. In every format possible, whether you're asked to do training, whether you're asked to do teaching, whether you're asked to make a speech, always say yes to the best of your ability so that you'll have one more time to share, one more time to help somebody lift themselves from poverty to success, from doubt to faith, from illness to health, from skepticism to belief. One more chance, person to person, or class to class, or a little Sunday morning class, or a little home meeting, or a personal conversation at Denny's coffee shop. Tell somebody something good, something valuable. The payoff for you is in the attempt and the learning experience. And then the payoff later is to get someone's testimonial that's got your name included. So I want to thank you for spending all this time this morning. Let us now look at your watch and let's be back at 10.31.
Okay, just do the necessary quickly and come right back. Because we've got to get there. I live down in Sarasota, Florida, and uh, I've been in network marketing now for 20 years. I got introduced to uh, Jim Rohn back then. He's one of my uh, original mentors, and uh, some of the things he shared with me just changed my life forever. Uh, you know, and uh, I've been a big student. Uh, I've kept myself in that learning environment, learning and growing with the books and the tapes, and like this weekend, being here at this live seminar, you know, and being able to spend two or three days with Jim and some of the other speakers is wonderful. And uh, it's changed my life. I was a broke waiter, and uh, in the last 20 years, I've been able to earn excess of $50 million in the network marketing industry. So, thank you, Jim, and thank you so many others. My name is Orrin Hudson, founder, founder and president of BeSomeone.org. Oh, it's like getting a blank, uh, blank check on the future. I've, you know, learned so much, and some of the principles that I've learned uh, for the last 30 years that I've known Jim Rohn has really transformed my life. I can remember when I was in the housing project, I couldn't afford to, his book, so uh, I went to the library, and they ordered from another library that they didn't have, and just 30 years ago, I'm living my dream because of some of the concepts that I learned from Jim Rohn. Uh, for my life to get better, I had to get better that no one was coming to the rescue. And when I learned this principle, my whole life has changed. And I started uh, doing the things I need to do to be successful. When I, re when I realized that it was only me that could save myself. I recommend anyone uh, in the world to really visit Jim Rohn. I bought all of his product and to distribute them to my brothers and sisters. I think what he's doing is the, the best teachings on the planet. My name is Cindy Goodwin and I live in New Hampshire. And I educate others for a living. And I'm constantly learning from Jim and his personal philosophy about taking care of yourself for others so others can take care of themselves for you is something that we talk about in my house and with my students, and it's great. I'm still learning every day. That's why I'm here. Okay. My name is Frederick Talon. I'm coming from Belgium. Uh, the reason why I've come here to watch Jim Wan because uh, he's a great inspirer. Uh, we meet, read uh, many books of him. We love him. Uh, and I would like to, insp to, to have his knowledge to help other people by uh, reaching uh, the maximum in their life um, and also want to follow them in, in his steps into the future. Hello, I'm Suzanne from Belgium. Uh, the reason that I come here is because we had a couple uh, of trainings before of him. He already inspired me a lot. Uh, our personal life has also has changed a lot. Uh, also, the financial dreams are coming true now in our life. We, can, we have more financial freedom. We help also a lot of other people also getting improved their life in health, but also in financial uh, freedom. And it's really changing a lot of people. And that's what, why, what we like about Jim Rohn. And that's what we want to give. That's the reason why we are here. Hello, I'm Geert uh, Wells, also from Belgium. Uh, almost one year ago, I started with the one-year plan from Jim Rohn. And the first three months already was incredible what happened. Just unbelievable in 90 days. So when we get the possibility just to attend the event, for me the decision was quick made. Just I want to go to see everything in life and see what happens afterwards. It's just incredible. I was working one year hard work and nothing changed. And then with 90 days, already just the first 90 days, I doubled my income. 90 days, I get a huge organization. A lot of people who like to work with me, I like to work with the other people. It's just incredible, only the start already. My name is Michael Bennett, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm uh, in direct sales, and I love Jim Rohn. When I first heard his tape about uh, planting seeds, I listened to it like 15 times. And to see him in person is awesome, because he's one of those people that speaks right to the soul of people, whether you're new in this business, you've been in this business a while. He's just an awesome guy. He's like a mentor that, that you can put in a, in a CD or a tape. If you want to understand the cream of the crop and understand where it all comes down, come see Jim Rohn. Listen to Jim Rohn, because he's the guy that taught most of the other people that inspire and motivate us. Hi, my name is Charles Kelly. I'm from London. I've come here to see Jim Rohn. The reason I wanted to come here and actually see him is to see if he was better live than he is on tape. And I think so far he has been better live than on tape. Um, this morning, I think I've got out of uh, the situation this morning, is, is he said, he keeps saying, why not? Why not go for it? Why not do something extraordinary with my life? And that's what I'm going to do. Thank you very much. My name is James Blakemore and I'm from Midland, Texas. About eight years ago I had the incredible opportunity 
to hear a gentleman speak. His name was James Rohn. And the two-day seminar that I attended changed my life completely. I went from a person who was not even entitled to success to understanding why you become what you, you earn what you become, and you become successful by what you become. I continue to listen. I, I, I consume everything that Jim Rohn puts out. I attend every opportunity. At every opportunity, I attend every seminar, meeting, anytime I can get in front of the man, I do. My name is Jeff Weisberg from Moorpark, California. Uh, I've been involved in my own business now for over 20 years. Had an opportunity many years ago to first hear from Jim Rowan. And I think it's very important that all the different growth that a person gets, they need to have continuous education. And Jim's amazing. At his age now, he's still running around the world helping and changing people's lives. And I think that for people that haven't had an opportunity to experience them, they need to. And for people that haven't had an opportunity to learn and develop and grow from his teachings and people that he's taught and mentored, it's definitely something you want to be part of. Hello everyone, this is Jerry Clark of ClubRhino.net. We're sitting here at the Jim Rohn Leadership Event in Anaheim, California. We have had a great time learning from some of the giants of the industry, such as Jim Rohn, Brian Tracy, and the individual I have with me today, which is Dennis Waitley. And many of you know of Dennis Waitley because you've listened to several of his programs, just like I did a number of years ago. As a matter of fact, in 1986 is when I picked up some of his first training materials that I actually started learning from. Uh, the Psychology of Winning, all-time best-selling classic. You have uh, Seas of Greatness, uh, Being the Best, uh, Empires of the Mind. I mean, I can go on and on with the programs that Dennis have come out with. And Dennis, he also, for 12 years, has been the uh, Olympic coach, like the mental toughness, the mental training coach uh, for the Olympic athletes. And so we are fortunate to have him here today. He's taking some time out to share some insights and so forth. So, Dennis, we want to welcome you here with us. Thanks, Jerry. It's great to be with you. Now, the first question, you're talking about mental toughness. This is re really important because a lot of people listening and watching right now, they want to know how do they develop a mental toughness in life, in business life, uh, as far as people who are entrepreneurial minded, they're out there doing things that are a little different than a regular population as far as, you know, they want to make things happen on their own. How do they develop that mental toughness that it's really going to take in order to make it? I think one of the first things is to always be prepared for a surprise. And the surprise is likely to be a negative surprise every day. Something's going to happen to in your day, whether you're going to be late behind a train, uh, your car's going to have a flat tire. Mm -hmm. Something's going to happen to you. And the ability to be able to, to take molehills and continue to make them molehills instead of mountains, to look at problems as being normal. Mm -hmm. Problems are a normal part of change. So because we're changing so rapidly, there are going to be a lot of problems you face. And to look at failure as an event, that's the important thing. A failure is not a person. Mm. I'm not a failure. I've had a failure. I've had a temporary inconvenience. I've had a stumbling block. Mm. And the idea is to turn a stumbling block into a stepping stone and mm. step on it rather than stumble over it. So I always say look at failure as the fertilizer of success. Wow. The fertilizer, the fertilizer stinks. Wow. <laughs> it smells, right. you know, I mean, you put it on your grass and say, wow, that guy's just fertilized his lawn. Sure, mm. you fertilize your life with your mistakes. Mm. You don't wallow in them. You don't lay in them. You don't roll in them. You pick yourself up off your mistake and you learn from it and try not to repeat that same thing again. Mm. But you look at it as a temporary inconvenience. It's a detour. Mm. It's a detour in life is a, a failure. So are these the same principles that the athletes, the Olympic athletes use when they, or maybe they're in practice or so, or so forth, and they do a routine and it doesn't work out the way they really felt it should have worked out, or they're actually in the Olympic Games and they don't win that gold medal. Uh, typically, they don't just give up and say, oh, forget it. You know, typically, they come back four years later and they go at it again, and they're doing years and years of practice just to get back to that point. So are you saying it's the same type of uh, mindset that it takes to be a champion in athletes and uh, athletics that it takes to be a champion in business. Absolutely. There's, there's two times when you use it, before you perform and right after. Mm -hmm. So it's called simulation and then replay. Wow. And the replay after a failure is as important as the replay after a success. So the idea is when you miss, you say, that's not like me. I'm better than that. Mm -hmm. That's not like me. Come on, get with it. So you teach an athlete to slap his thigh and say, come on, that's not like you. Let's get with it. Let's get going now. Come on, let's get back on it. 
let's get back on the ball. And so I'm learning myself in my life. I say, come on, Dennis, that's not like you. You're a lot better than this. You're better than this, so let's get back to where we belong here. Let's remember what we've learned. Let's slow down, take a deep breath, focus, relax, concentrate, and follow through. Next time, we'll get it right. The important thing is to look at a failure as an event, a single performance that you must take and make lead back to the original goal. Mm -hmm. The problem is most people say, oh, man, I blew it. What a, oh, gee. And they, and they rest on that, and they reinforce that mistake instead of taking it and correcting it to the target. So it's really important to do target correction. Hmm. So basically what you're saying is that it's just all these are mental strategies, mental tools that we can use as kind of like reforming our self-talk. Um, instead of saying the negative disempowering type things, say the positive and empowering type things. And so in order for a person to get to a point where they're used to doing that, because initially it seems like they have to consciously think about you know, making sure that they say uh, an empowering word or empowering phrase. So to get to that point, does it require, you know, your regular reading books, going to seminars like the Jim Rohn uh, leadership event we're at right now, uh, listening to tapes and so forth? Does it require those type of things to even get to that point? Or can anyone who hasn't even done a lot of personal development just say, hey, I'm going to choose to have really good self-talk? Well, it's pretty hard to go cold turkey on anything, mm. mainly because you don't really stop a habit you replace a habit. And if, oh. if it's habitual, a habitual way of talking or feeling or explaining, I call it the positive explanatory style versus the negative explanatory style. Mm. So well, I like you to explain the explanatory styles. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like to uh, interview people and I ask mm -hmm. them how it's going. Mm -hmm. And I ask them, uh, you know, if it's what kind of day is it for you? Mm -hmm. And if the weather enters into the picture, then I know that, that it's not mental because the weather is an external factor. So if the externals in life are the things that determine whether you have a good day or not, uh, you're being, if you will, you're a thermometer. A thermometer is a passive device that lays there and tells you how, how the world is doing on the outside. Mm. A thermostat is what you set on the temperature that you want, then it controls the air conditioning and the heating. If you look at your body and brain as the hardware in your computer, and you look at the software as the things you put in your mind, you have a software program that drives the hardware. So the software is what you need to program with the instructions to have the computer follow directions. And so you tell a computer what you want it to do and the software program determines the outcome of what the computer does. Most mm -hmm. people don't know how to program their software to get the outcomes they want. Hmm. And the sad thing is that most people's software has already been programmed by someone else. No question. And so now they're Every operating day. that, right? Every day. Constantly. Yeah, it's been programmed by the evening news. It's being programmed Ooh. by uh, sitcoms, reality TV shows, commercials. Hmm. They tell us what to eat. They tell us what to buy. They tell us how to dress. They tell us what to think. They hmm. tell us who to vote for. And we just listen and, and we say, wait a minute, I'm too smart for that. I'm not going to pay any attention to that. Too late. Wow. Observation, imitation, repetition, right. habit, amazing. practice, secondhand smoke, secondhand violence, secondhand. It, it goes in and sticks. Second and even if TV. we don't want to do it, mm. we do it anyway. That's called the perception to buy. Mm. Uh, the advertising manipulates perception, so you buy what they want you. And the same thing is true with self talk and controlled thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, makes you control your habits so that you do maybe what's good for you. And the question is, who's putting what into your mind? Is it junk food uh, in your mind or are you putting in some stuff that really makes your mind work well? Mm, wow. And so basically what you're talking about is that even if someone says, you know, I'm not really watching TV to watch the TV. It's just I have it on. So, you know, they might be sleeping and they have the TV on. But what you're saying is if all that positive stuff going in, it's like if you put something, you got something in your throat and you have to cough, you, <coughs> you got to get it out, right? Yep. Okay, and then if you got to get it out, and if you keep it in, then what's going to happen is, you know, it's just going to stay in. It's still there. So are you saying that no matter what, it still comes in even if you just have it like secondhand TV, so to speak? Well, yeah, it, it's true. It does go in unless you're asleep. There, there's been a a misnomer. In other words, uh, you really don't learn while you sleep. So mm -hmm. sleep learning, uh, the Russians tried it, and the important thing about sleep is you need to dream. Mm -hmm. 
and you dream about every 30 to 40 minutes. You go down into a deep sleep, come back up and have a dream. So you have so many dreams per night. If you tried to learn stuff while you're asleep, it would interrupt your dreams and you would be irritable and you would uh, actually be a little bit paranoid. So mm. the best time to get inputs is mm. when you're relaxed, not paying any attention to it. Mm. And that's where television and commercials and radio and all these things have the biggest impact on teenagers because they're really not paying that much attention to it. What wow. they say is, ah, look, the lyrics don't mean anything to me. I like the beat. Right. I like the beat, but mm. the lyrics, I don't pay any attention. Well, the truth is, that's worse. They don't have to pay attention wow. because it's going in and sticking anyway. So, in order to reprogram ourselves, then it's going to take just a constant, um, you know, injecting ourselves, so to speak, with, you know, like materials that you've come out with over the years. Sees a great in psychology of winning, which is the like the, one of the best-selling audio programs of Nightingale Conan of all times. Um, going to events like this, like the Jim Rohn event, going to your different trainings that you do, just constantly bombarding or saturating your mind is kind of like a reverse brainwashing, so to speak, because everyone tells me, you know, Jerry, you're just brainwashing people, you know, when they come to my seminars. You're brainwashing people and so forth. And I just say, hey, they've already been brainwashed. No, it's and, the opposite. You know, yeah, it's, call, it's called dehypnosis. Dehypnosis. It's dehypnotizing what they've already been hypnotized because hypnosis means sleep. Mm. Hypno. Uh, from sleep. So hypnosis is when you learn when you're relaxed and you repeat things, but you didn't remember that you learned them. So you dehypnotize people by helping them take in stuff mm -hmm. that's good for them mm -hmm. rather than not recognize they're taking in stuff that's bad for them. Wow. So obviously you have to read a lot of books, mm -hmm. listen to a lot of programs, listen to positive radio, watch the Discovery Channel, watch National Geographic, mm -hmm. listen to great music, and go out to ethnic restaurants and watch people who are doing great things and you know really get involved with people who are trying to make a difference in the world the next thing you know you say wow some of that stuff's rubbing off on me hmm now what do you say to someone who's you know they're, they're watching and they're listening right now and they're saying you know one of the things is that I listen to tapes and I read the books and so forth but when it comes to really taking action sometimes I might start to take an action and then I kinda like stop so they're not able to be consistent with the action they know they should be taking and so they end up procrastinating. What do you say to people like that? Well, I say that's a little voice inside you that tells you you can't do it. Mm -hmm. It's the voice of fear. We all have that, that little voice inside of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you say to them is uh, find someone mm -hmm. who will keep you honest by making you accountable by having a buddy. And the buddy says, wait a minute, you and I said we were going to, we said we were going to meet at 6 o'clock in the morning and I showed and you didn't. Come on. You said you're going to be there. Mm -hmm. And when you announce to somebody else that you're going to do something, you kind of make a commitment back and forth to a friend. So it's really important, maybe, mm -hmm. not to try to do it alone. Mm -hmm. Because by ourselves, I'm included, I, you know, I'm a great procrastinator. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to the program, but I put it off. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I went to the memory program, but I forgot where I put the tape. <laughs> 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 now, what, what about happiness? Um, that's a, a one key thing that people ask me all the time. They say, you know, how do I become happy? You know, it's like a lot of people are chasing things in order to be happy. They think they have to get something in order to be happy. What's your take on happiness? And where is, what is happiness? And where can people get it or find it for people that are chasing for it? That's just it. <laughs> you can't drive it. You can't wear it. You can't live in it. You can't drink it, smoke it, snort it. You can't travel to it. Happiness is uh, the experience of the journey. Mm -hmm. It's like brushing your teeth or driving your car. It's a second nature kind of thing. And it doesn't come as a result of anything. Mm -hmm. Because if you're waiting for results to make you happy, there are going to be good results and bad results. Mm -hmm. So you'll be happy sometimes and sad other times. The experience of happiness becomes uh, a way of looking at everything. And so I am happy because uh, that's the way I am, because that's the way I've been thinking. Mm. But it, it isn't a result of anything that's happened to me. Wow. I just decided to be a happy guy. Mm. And so when I look at something, I say, uh, can do, no problem. Uh, that's not going to make me unhappy. And they say, come on, you just came back from Africa. There are 400,000 child refugees from AIDS over there. Don't tell me that doesn't make you sad. I said, it makes me compassionate. It makes me want to do something. It makes me grateful that I live where I live. It makes me not want to waste. It makes mm -hmm. me want to help them. Mm -hmm. But it can't make me unhappy because if it makes me unhappy, 
I wouldn't have the energy or the excitement to help them. Mm. I wouldn't have the passion because passion, in my case, comes from being excited and being happy. Mm. And that's powerful, is that it's a choice. And that's a really Happiness is a choice. It really is a choice. And people say, come on, how, can I, easy, right? how can I be happy? Mm. And you mm -hmm. say, well, uh, try it. Mm. You know. Because for people thinking that it's going to take something else, when they get that something else, then they start to realize, well, maybe this is not it. Maybe it's going to take something else. So they're always looking for something else to make them happy. And that's probably one of the reasons that actually causes some of the addictions and some of the things that, that we have is because once they realize it's not that, they start feeling depressed and, oh, my goodness, what is it? And then they start all this addictive behavior. Well, a lot of there's an answer to a riddle, too. And the riddle is, do we sing because we're happy mm -hmm. or do we become happy because we sing? But yes, the answer is true. So let's say you're not happy. Mm -hmm. I believe that if you sing a happy song, the lyrics and the tune will create more happiness in you. Mm -hmm. So as simple as it sounds, if you're singing a happy song, the mind doesn't know the difference that you're unhappy or happy. So when I sing, mm -hmm. you know, it's like whistling when you're afraid. Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. You say, why are you whistling? Well, I'm afraid and I'm trying to whistle myself out of being afraid. Well, that, it, it really happens that way. Mm. And so I try to sing a happy song in life, even if I'm not really happy at the moment, and it gets me back into where I think I belong. Wow. So as we're wrapping up here, why do you feel it's important for people to come to events like uh, the Jim Rohn Leadership event that we're at right now and all the different trainings that you do and Brian Tracy does and all the other trainers out there? that have great and valuable information to share. Why do you think that's important for people who are listening or watching right now to constantly engage themselves in that type of activity? Because 90% of what you'll ever see in here is negative on a daily and nightly basis, and you have to do something to overcome that. And I think Zig says it best, you know, mm -hmm. he and I started speaking together about 1974. Wow. And he said that, uh, just because you take a bath, that doesn't mean you don't need to take one tomorrow. Wow. So one bath does not make you clean, and therefore one seminar does not change your life. Mm. Billy Graham and I are really good friends, and he said, uh, I don't change lives, Dennis. I give them information, and I give them the, maybe a little bit of input to cause them to think a little more. But he said they'd have to come to hundreds and hundreds of meetings before they would decide to really make a change. So I think we're just... These meetings are catalysts. Mm. They're constant reminders that, uh, that we can do this stuff if we just keep that more in mind than the evening news. Mm. That is excellent. Now, I know that uh, people that are listening and watching right now, they can go to jimrohn.com and find some of the materials that you have. But you also have a website that have a lot more materials that they're not going to be able to find there. Um, is it dennisweightley.com? Sure, they can go to dennisweightley.com or just waitley.com, just Waitley. w-a-i-t-l-e-y.com. Okay, and if they go to Dennis, they spell it with one N. Yes, <laughs> yeah, if they go to Dennis Waitley, yeah, I'm a one N Dennis. My mom <laughs> lost an N. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dennis, we appreciate your time, your energy, and I thank you personally for over all the years of, of coming out with the empowering information that actually empowers my life and actually allowed me to create millionaire status and be able to produce great results in my life and go out there and share with other people. So on behalf of myself and all the other people at this Jim Rohn Leadership event and all the other people that are watching and that are listening that don't happen to be at this event right now, we want to thank you from the bottom of our heart and say keep up the great work out there and keep empowering people like you do. Thank you very much and you've got the baton for the next generation. Uh, thank you. We gladly hand it to you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you.